President Trump is putting the bully in bully pulpit. He's on the attack this weekend, so seemingly supporting calls for a Justice Department probe into his opponents. But of all the tweets there's been, I, I want to hone in on just one of the many attacks. This is his bald-faced lie about New York Times reporter Maggie Haberman. Trump lashed out after reading this story in the paper by Haberman and two other reporters. It says his personal lawyer, Michael Cohen, could flip. Now, Trump took exception to some of the quotes in the story, uh, the quotes saying that he treated Cohen like garbage. So I guess now he's treating Haberman like garbage. He's calling her a third-rate reporter and a crooked Hillary flunky who I don't speak to and have nothing to do with. Let's just stop right there. That tweet is wrong in at least four different ways. He didn't even spell her name right. And he called her a third-rate reporter, even though he knows she dominates the White House beat. Heck, she just won a Pulitzer a few days ago. And next weekend, she's accepting another award, this time at the White House Correspondents' Dinner, for, in the words of the judges, showing her deep understanding of what makes President Trump tick. That's what makes this tweet a lie. You know, sometimes covering the president, it's difficult to determine what is actually a lie, but this one is crystal clear. Trump said, quote, I don't speak to her, and I have nothing to do with her. And here they are in the Oval Office together. Haberman has interviewed Trump on the record more than a dozen times since 2015. Uh, by the way, she doubles as a political analyst here at CNN. And I know she takes these attacks in stride, but I don't want to. Lying is disrespectful. And it's not just disrespectful to Haberman or to journalists, but to the public. We all know the president uses Twitter to deliver talking points to his base. It's very effective for him. But it's also disrespectful. Is he really, does he really think that his believers, his supporters, are going to believe this lie? You know, when there's photographic proof to the contrary? It is disrespectful to his fans, to his Twitter followers, to post this kind of stuff. And we haven't even gotten to the tweet about Chuck Todd. So what do you do about a bully? Joining me now, a truly all-star panel, John Avalon, the editor-in-chief of The Daily Beast and a CNN political analyst, Ed Felsenthal, the editor-in-chief of Time Magazine, and Washington Post staff writer Sarah Ellison. There's lots for us to dig in on this hour, including the news about Sean Hannity and Michael Cohen. Let's save that for a little later. I just want to start on the idea of bullying John Avalon. Let's put up the Chuck Todd tweet from this morning. The president once again calling the host of NBC's Meet the Press uh, sleepy eyes and calling NBC fake news. I know, I know, we've seen it and we've heard it all before. But this is bullying by the president of the United States, and I think it deserves to be the lead story. You're damn right. And look, I mean, Trump is proud about putting the bully back in bully pulpit, as you said. And some of his supporters will no doubt make that a T-shirt at some point. But it diminishes <laughs> the office of president, as does his transactional relationship with the truth. We almost get inured to the idea that the president of the United States calling out individual reporters in typo-written, sloppy, bullying emails is normal because this is the president and this is his style. We know it's not normal because we have 44 other presidents to compare him to, and nothing like this has happened in American history. I mean, even just the Comey memos this week. We know he talked about jailing journalists in the Oval Office, and that doesn't even rise to the level of, of, our, of, our, of our story cash because it seems part of a theme, because it is. But it's dangerous, it dumbs us down, and it really shows the extent to which he's part of a piece of, of political leaders who attack the press as a matter of principle, and that's usually seen in autocrats, not the United States of America. This is one of those words versus actions issues, isn't it, John? I mean, th this issue about jailing journalists, the president talking about it with Comey more than a year ago, now it's revealed in the Comey memos. Sarah, do, do some journalists look at that and say, well, he's just talking about it, he's not actually doing it, so it's the big deal? No, I don't think most journalists do say that. Of course, I think a lot of journalists even recognized under the Obama administration that that was not an administration that was particularly press friendly. But what Trump is doing, and I think what these attacks do, is in addition, first of all, he has always opposed the press. That's always been a wonderful and very popular talking point for him. And his, his fans really like to hate the press. They like to boo the journalists who are at his rallies during the campaign, and that has continued. Yeah. The effect of that, though, is that it's a very it's very fertile, and Steve Bannon has talked about this, mm -hmm. that as soon as you have people not believing what's in the press, then you open up a whole other avenue for you to deliver a different message, right. one that is entirely, you know, whatever it is that you say is the truth. Yeah, and an alternative that, reality. Yeah. Right, and I think yeah. this is, you know, alternative facts. We're all sort of familiar with this, but I think that the, the, it's the public opinion of the press really does lead the way, I think, in some ways, for a greater kind of 
legal action against journalists. I think people will be mm. more primed for that kind of activity. You're saying it softens the ground. I think it does. For future action. I think mm -hmm. it could. What do you do? You think so, Ed? I, you know what worries me most uh, and echoes something John McCain has been saying. Uh, wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post early in the year. Uh, I think Sarah's certainly right. We can worry about what happens in our own country, but this empowers this kind of talk empowers repressive regimes around the world that are already jailing journalists. There are two terrific Reuters journalists in jail right now in Myanmar for reporting that led to a Pulitzer Prize this week. Isn't the president's bullying rewarded, however? Case in point, your magazine. You have Ted Cruz this week praising President Trump uh, in the pages of the Time 100. Ted Cruz, of course, who was bullied by the president, attacked by the president during the primaries. Uh, and yet, Ted Cruz turned around, praised him uh, lovingly. You know, uh, if, if Ted Cruz is going to turn around and do that, you know, that's an example of bullying maybe working. Well, lo loving up your op opponents you fought viciously in a campaign is a, a time-honored political tradition. Although right. this one... Um, this one went further than I think uh, yeah. one well, might have expected. Kudos to you guys for getting him to write it, I guess. Yeah, yeah but, I mean, but this is this is less sort of mending fences and more sim Stockholm Syndrome. I mean, this is really <laughs> about a party that's enthralled to a bully and people and senators in private saying things to reporters that are totally contrary to what they're willing to say in public much of the time. It shows that, the, you know, look, the president and the president are going to be in tension. That's time-honored. But there is a problem that goes well beyond partisanship with this president that too many Republicans will only acknowledge in private because in public they're afraid mm -hmm. of angering their base. But this is a real departure, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't mince it. And when we can see just the tracking of the term fake news, it leaders around the world. Assad uses it. Erdogan uses it. Putin uses it. That's the legitimacy of the American president helps mainstream that, and that's why it matters. So since this show is called Reliable Sources, let's talk about some of the administration's um, sloppiness and, and, and why this matters. Uh, accuracy is part of the job for doctors, for engineers, for reporters, for lots of people. Uh, every time I make a mistake, or I have to run a correction, I am mortified. But it doesn't seem to be true for the White House. The president's spelling mistakes are infamous at this point. There's a couple from the past couple of days here. Shady Comey misspelled on Twitter. Uh, there's also factual errors. Let me show you one about Key West. The president went to Key West on Thursday. Then on Saturday, he said, I had a great time there yesterday. He meant two days ago. You know, we could go on and on with these. A special counsel spelled the wrong way instead of the special counsel Mueller. There's all of these examples of the errors that he shares on Twitter. And I think it trickles down to the staff as well. I thought the, the most embarrassing error of the week was in a statement uh, on the occasion of Barbara Bush's passing. Uh, the date was wrong on the statement. It said 2017. It meant 2018. This was a statement that could have been written days ahead of time. I would have been happy to proofread it for them or fact check it for them. I, I just wonder what the panel thinks of this because I, I know this is not the most important issue in the world, but I do think it's important because it speaks to if you can't get the small stuff right, can you get the big stuff right, like a North Korea summit? Uh, Ed, do you agree? Is this matter? Is this matter at all? I, I mean, I think it's more of a reflection of the way this White House operates, um, which, among other things, is seat of the pants fashion. Um, and, you know, we all know from running news organizations and being part of news organizations that you make the most errors when, when you're flying off on deadline or, or uh, you know, there's not an orderly process. And I right. think that's really more what this is an indication of than than a, a, a critical national issue around spelling. Yeah, it's not number one, but does it matter, John? Of course it does. Um, look, tone comes from the top. That's the, that's the key thing in any organization. So if the president has an untidy mind, isn't paying attention to details or pesky things like facts, it flows through the organization. And look, while I think we have greater uh, roles and responsibilities than being the grammar police for the presidency, it's worth assuming that the president of the United States should be held to at least the same standard as a cub reporter. If, if, we're, if we're letting him off the hook there, I think that's itself a sign of a slippery slope in our standards. Sarah? I actually wonder if this kind of a conversation is exactly the kind of thing his base would mock, that, th that they would maybe see this as it's some sort of authenticity. Obviously, he's doing his own tweets. He's not right. getting someone to manage his account for him. And Some I mean, people I mean, suggest that he makes errors on purpose, oh. on purpose, in order to appeal to you know, ordinary folks who, I'm, look, I'm, I'm well, mistakes, I mean, I can just, everybody does. Maybe he's trying to look Maybe like it works for him. I, I mean, obviously, those kinds of things work for him in a way that doesn't resonate with this panel. But I think that there could be a real, either deliberate effort to do that or it's just something that shows hey i'm busy i'm doing a lot of things so what if i have a misspelling or two i mean that is a, a trump i think we should all be more concerned with the facts and than than the spelling yeah
And the issue with the tweet this morning about Chuck Todd talking about denuclearization uh, is a real question about whether that's accurate or not. What the North Koreans mean by denuclearization is very different from what the Americans mean. Uh, so th those issues, I think, w even though it's on Twitter and it's just a tweet, those are important issues that are at stake. Precision matters in policy. G governing cannot is not the same thing as grandstanding. And so that's why these things do matter. We have, remember, every tweet we know is an official presidential statement. He's and issuing it, policy on that's Twitter. Right. So in fact, it is. I mean, what he does on Twitter is not just a tweet. It is actual. It's his organ of communication. So.